My name is Sasha De Bruel. Um, Nev Jones. And the two of us, we actually we've been we've been collaborating together, but we actually just met for the first time two days ago, and this is our excuse to. This is like uh, this is us getting to know each other, <laughs> leading this workshop. <laughs> on, on, on stage in front of a, a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, real quick, just so that we we're all clear about some things. So. Both Nev and I work in the mental health system, and we share in common the belief that the mental health system is incredibly screwed up. Like, it's, like it, it's full of problems. And, and so what we're going to do, the reason that we're using this language of radical to talk about the work that we're doing is that we're, we're basically saying if, if we actually want to make changes in the system, we have to uh, dig deep and... Um, and, and Look at how we can uh, look at how we can go about uh, making changes, like fundamental changes. And what we're doing, like in this next hour, is we're going to talk about the peer specialist role because we both um, we both do work around the the peer role. Just to just to get a sense in the room, how many people here in the room are actually work in in peer roles? Show of hands. Oh, wow. So a bunch of people. Um, and then, how many people in the room work in first episode psychosis programs? Wow. Yeah, a bunch of people. Okay, so so the, here's the deal. Like, we, <laughs> so um, really, what we're gonna do? We're gonna try and talk as little as possible. We're gonna try. We're gonna we're gonna do our talking because really, like, this is this op this great opportunity to be in a room full of people, and then we wanna have a, a discussion. And so just so you have a sense of what we're going to try and accomplish in a very short period of time is we're, we're going to talk about our own histories and like how we ended up doing the work that we're doing. Um, and then Nev is going to break down the landscape of, of uh, early intervention services in, in North America. And then we're going to talk about this idea of disruptive innovation um, and system evolution. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. So... Oh, it's me up first. Okay. All right. So I work at a place called On Track New York in New York City, which is a first episode psychosis program. And I get to train all the peer specialists for, for On Track New York. But before that, before, like before I did that, me and my friends started this organization called the Icarus Project. And I'm wondering how many people have heard of the Icarus Project? Wow. All right, well, that makes me feel good. Um, so, so 15 years ago, we started this organization that was like, ended up, it started off as a website, um, and it developed into a network of peer-based mental health support groups. And the, the vision of the group was basically, um, you know, it was started by people who had been diagnosed with serious mental illnesses. But rather than seeing ourselves as diseased and disordered, we saw ourselves as having dangerous gifts, like having wings, like the boy Icarus. So that was our like metaphor. Um, and it, over a short period of time, we ended up becoming this like magnet for really interesting people, because you know we ended up drawing a lot of really brilliant, kind of crazy people to, together. Um, and we wrote this book, navigating the space between brilliance and madness, and then. Shortly after that, we wrote this book called Friends Make the Best Medicine, a guide to creating community mental health support networks. And it was, it was basically a guide for people to start local peer support groups. And then people did that all over the place. Um, and so all this time later, I work in the psychiatric system, but that is my foundation. That is where I come from. Like when, when we talk about peer work, the peer work that I think about is based in a social movement that's outside the mental health system. So that's, that's uh, you know, so I'm, now I pass it to Ned. Okay, that was very fast, Sasha. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, um, my, my work in the Hearing Voices movement, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of kind of personal background and, and kind of history. So, um, so I went through um, one of the earliest specialized first episode psychosis programs in the country in Chicago. Um, 
about a decade ago, over a decade ago, maybe now. Um, and, you know, I, I think I sort of, I, I saw in those moments the potential for early intervention, the sort of potential for what could be accomplished, for how that could redirect people's trajectories. And I also sort of experienced things about it that were definitely not, not doing what, what we would ideally be doing, um, especially from a more sort of transformative, visionary perspective um, of what that could look like, what those initial encounters with the system could look like. And specifically, some of that was all of my experience were um, sort of constrained around these ideas of, you know, there's something wrong with you, um, that you're experiencing all of this distress, all of these problems, and almost all conversations. And once you get sort of into the system and you're in these intensive services, you know, most of whom you're interacting with now are clinicians or folks associated with these programs, and almost all of those conversations really being about the problems you're experiencing, and whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy which was the modality in my program, or whether it was medication management, all of it became about um, the, the sort of the, the distress, the pathology, how is this you know, person now who was embroiled in these problems that had to be worked through. And many, 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 many aspects of my experience that to me were incredibly salient. I'm first of all just coming to grips with these pretty profound transformations of um, you know, perception and sensation and how I was moving through the world and the difference between my mind and other people's minds and not being able to distinguish between what was a thought and what was somebody else talking, what was me talking, what were my own thoughts, could people hear all of that. You know, radical changes and changes that kind of cut to the core of who you are as an individual. And so all of that, so much of that, that was not what we discussed in sessions. That was not what my psychiatrist was interested in, um, right? So, um, so I, you know, I found out about the Hearing Voices movement, you know, probably after two or three or four years of more kind of conventional psychiatric treatment. And, and to me, what really appealed to me is that it was creating spaces to really sort of explore and engage with these experiences in all their richness and depth. Um, and really explore the impacts on one's identity and who one is in a fundamental way and how one would move through the world and political dimensions of these experiences. And I guess I just really want to emphasize that, that is, that's very, very different to the sort of the implicit, tacit framing of these experiences in conventional mental health services, early intervention included. Um, so I... Um, first in Chicago, founded Chicago Hearing Voices. Um, that was when I was a grad student. That's when I had the most time to really do a lot of um, facilitation work. Um, and then moved to uh, San Francisco and worked with the Bay Area Hearing Voices Network. We have Dina and Stella here <laughs> um, who are awesome. How many of you, just to ask a really quick question, actually have local hearing voices groups that you work with, are involved with? Awesome, cool, cool. Um, so, you know, so I think similar to Sasha, right, coming from this perspective of there is so much to this experience, there's, there's so much that you need to work through um, as a young person, as a young adult experiencing it. So much there to sort of really recover, to more deeply heal in terms of identity and who you are. Um, and, and, and I think the key question is how do we bring that to this early intervention space? Um, and I guess I'll just go in here to a little bit of history and context. So this is a map, just so you all know what you're seeing, um, of early intervention programs spread out across the United States. Um, huge, huge number of these programs now. Um, just 10 years ago, I think there were maybe four or five um, in the United States. So it's, it's really kind of phenomenal growth. This is an opportunity. Um, right? This is an opportunity to really kind of influence a space that is reaching an increasingly huge proportion of, you know, young people um, experiencing a first episode of psychosis. So there's huge opportunity here. Now, I want to give you a little bit of context, because in the United States, a lot of the first clinics that sprang up, ESA is an exception, but a lot of the, a lot of the initial clinics, these were academic clinics run by actually sort of neuroimaging folks who needed an antipsychotic, naive population to study. So they wanted to be able to capture this population, and the best way to do it is to create a problem that is really kind of a program that is really specialized to serve um, the first episode 
episode group. Um, so the program I was in, for example, was you know simultaneous to entering it. You were you know went through a period of of you know antipsychotic free um, neuroimaging and cognitive testing and so forth. Um, so there's this very strong sort of medical model influence on early intervention in the U.S. Um, and as I think um, these programs really expand out into the community, that has started to sort of fade and recede somewhat. And then on track where Sasha works is just um, an example of a place where really amazing things are happening. I think in part because the program as a whole and the leadership of, as a whole have really kind of embraced um, adaptation on the ground and innovation and not getting stuck in a sort of a very conventional way of thinking about evidence-based practices and we implement them to fidelity and we do not change and we do not try new things. So that really kind of embracing a different way of thinking about things, deepening, complicating, um, you know, understanding how messy it, it, it all really is. Um, anything, I'm wondering if there's anything else, any, any, anything else that you guys want to, you know, ask really quickly about early intervention before we kind of move on? I'll, it sounds like a lot of you are involved, so I'm just not sure if there's any more, you know, kind of context that might be helpful. We're starting to see peer support pop up almost everywhere. Um, again, maybe like five years ago when I was talking to programs, very few had a peer support component. Now it's almost ubiquitous. Um, that does not mean that there are good supports in place or that the role, the role of the peer specialist or of peer support in these programs is what you know, people like Sasha and I, and I'm sure many of you in this room would like it to be. And so I think part of the motivation behind this presentation, right, is okay, how do we, um, you know, how do we take this new intervention area and how do we make what peer support folks are doing in this space matter? Um, how can that be leveraged to actually affect sort of a transformative vision of what things could be like instead of just being sort of a cog in the wheel of the status quo? And as we know, there's this incredible inertia and kind of constant regression back to the mean. How do we push things outside of that? So that's our, our motivation. I'm really enjoying being up on the stage with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you see, we spend a whole bunch of time like writing emails back and forth. So it's really, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things to understand, so the next few slides that you're going to see, I've come to realize actually is just like, it's my, it's like my internal coping me mechanism for being able to work at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. I mean, it's like how, how, I, how I have to frame what I'm doing. Because one of the things to understand, like Nev is alluding to, or actually just saying pretty directly, is you know, the, these programs that, that exist, they're problematic. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues with them. The funding that pays for my salary came from legislation that was passed after the Sandy Hook massacre in New Jersey, you know? So, so um, there's a frame that's like, what do we do with the what do we do with the crazy people? We we uh, we get them young. Um, so, all right. So here's my here here's my coping strategy. Just out of curiosity, how many people how many people have ever grown a garden? Raise your hand. Oh, I love this. When I do this in New York, it's like no one no one <laughs> no one knows what I'm talking about. So I have this like internal internal set of metaphors that I use for thinking about the stuff that we're doing. Um, and so when we talk about the trying to in, shift the landscape, you know, one way to think about it is, you know, we have, um, there's, this, there's this way of thinking about ecological succession. There's this way of thinking about, um, you know, if you cut down the trees in the forest, the first things that comes back are called the pioneer species. And then the pioneer species then pave the way for the next layer of succession. And, and, um, and you know, what, what we end up with is like a, a, healthy, a healthy ecosystem. And I, and I think, and just so you know, so like that's dandelion over there, that's fireweed, and those, that's blackberry. They're all examples of, uh, of pioneer species. They're like things that, things that come in to, to, try and, to try and heal the, the land. So... Um, how many people, this is, I'm curious, are people familiar with permaculture? 
Permaculture as a philosophy. So permaculture as a philosophy is this idea that you can take things, you can look at the way things happen in nature, and then develop human systems based on those things. Um, and, and so if you want to try and make change, it's often good to look at how, how things happen in nature. And so um, for the next couple minutes, we're going we're gonna to go through a little history lesson. We're going to talk about the consumer survivor expatient movement. And maybe, maybe someone out there in the audience is wondering why there's a photograph of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X under the consumer survivor expatient movement. And it's because, for me, I think it's a, the CSX movement was a really great example of a movement that, were, that was made up of reformers and radicals that figured out how to work together to make changes in the system. And that's like, if we look today, like starting in the 1970s, there was like, you know, shifts that were being tried to make in the mental health system, and there's a bunch of shifts that have been made. Now... The shifts look a little different, that, you know, depending on your perspective. I'm now going to show, uh, this is, this is, this is a, um, where I live in New York. If you go to the Peer Specialist website, um, this is the, this is, <laughs> this is the, this is the, the way that they're, this is the way that they're branding the Peer Specialists in New York State. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for those of you who don't know, there's peer specialists in, in North America, there are peer specialists in 38 states who are Medicaid reimbursable, and there's more than 25,000 people who are working in peer specialist roles. And that's happened in a very short period of time. You know, in the, the early 2000s, there was a, you know, the, the Center for Medicaid Services declared that peer specialists were uh, uh, an evidence-based practice. And so there's been, this, there's been this real change. And so if, if you want to, I labeled this the consumer movement because in many ways, um, the language of psychiatric rehabilitation and the, the language of, of the consumer movement is a reformist movement. It's a movement that, that, you know, that's not wanting to change the mental health system too much, but wanting to make reforms within it. And I think it's important when we think about the peer specialist role, like in 2017 today, that we look at some of the other roots of the peer specialist movement. And that, you know, at the same time that there was like a consumer movement, there were also other people who had some different visions about what, what, what it might look like to have, to have peer, like people who'd been diagnosed with mental illnesses working in the mental health system. And so, um, I'm going to move forward now and, and just like briefly discuss. Okay, so, so check it out. So I get hired at OnTrack New York, and they're like, we want, you to, um, we want you to run the peer specialist role. And, you know, I have this like cred because I started the Icarus Project, and I've been around. And they hand me this, they hand me this manual, um, and they're like, just look this over and see if there's any changes you want to make to it. And then... And then we can, we can uh, you know, you can start training the peers. We're starting to hire them on the teams. They're coming on. And I looked through the manual, and it was horrible. It was like, it was, it was like, it was all written in this, what I didn't, I didn't have the language to talk about it at the time, but it was psychiatric rehabilitation language. It was language where there wasn't a really clear delineation of what it meant to be a peer and what it meant to be a clinician. And there was like some stuff that was like, well, the peer, discloses their mental health recovery story, you know. Um, but there was no power. Like, the peers just, like, didn't have any power in it. Um, and so, you know, basically what I did, because I'm not very good at doing things by myself, I find other smart people, and I rewrote the manual with a bunch of other people, and we built it on a foundation of intentional peer support. Do people know about intentional peer support? Show of hands, let's see. So intentional peer support, I mean, I think it's worth saying that, you know, Sherry Mead, um, who was like the, the founder of intentional peer support, came, this is the tradition that she came from. This was like, she was like a, 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 a tradition that was very distrustful of the mainstream medical model and of the power dynamics going on in the mental health system. And so it's, it's, a, it's a system that actually has very, um, you know, 
they lay out very clearly. They're like, peer specialists are not there to be helpful. You're not there to help. You're there to learn with. You're there to, you're there to learn with other people. And maybe you need some help too, you know? Like, there's, a pow- like, there's, there's fundamental power shifts that go on when you, when you train in intentional peer support. Um, the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, we'll just do the show of hands again. We're on the West Coast. I'm curious. Do people know about Okay, so a lot less, so you should know that on the East Coast, there are these people doing really good peer work. They're like, they, who have very clear lines that they've drawn about what it means to be a peer, what it means to be a peer specialist and what it doesn't. Um, and then really the thing, let's see what the next slide is. All right. Um, the, the, so, so to come back to, to like, Come back to this metaphor of the pioneer species and the, um, you know, and like what it means to to be in the system and to try and make changes in the system. Part of the reason that I have this job and I get to do what I'm doing is that I have this mentor named Pat Deegan who contracts with On Track New York, and so I get to work directly with her developing trainings to do. To, to then go train all these peer specialists in New York State and then around the country. And she laid the groundwork for me to be able to come in. And now I'm in there and I, I bring with me all this other stuff. And so it, it, like thinking about succession and thinking about like how do we change things? You know, if we want to make radical change, it doesn't happen from just um, trying to tear down a wall. It, it really is more of an ecological systemic process. And so I feel like that's, that's, important, that's important to say. Um, so here's the thing. I, I, we have a couple more slides that are basically, we, actually, we just put this together right before the presentation. Um, <laughs> and um, and I'm, I guess I'm just going to show you. Um, this is kind of some of the stuff that I used to teach. I mean, I, just so you have a sense of like, you know, in New York, we have um, eight on-track teams that have peer specialists, and I get to train. I get to train them um, individually once a month, and and uh, at, together as a group once a month. They're scattered out all, all over New York State, um, and and I think one of the critical pieces. There's like a just a I guess a couple more things I'll say. Um, One of the things that I see, and maybe you all see it too, if you're in the similar world to where I am, is that peer specialists end up getting hired into agencies and working on clinical teams where their roles are not clearly defined. And so because the roles are not clearly defined, they end up doing clinical work because it's a clinical team after all. Um, and I think part of what we're trying to do is to lay down some very clear lines that say, um, that's not peer work. Like hiring people to do, to do like clinical work and paying them less than what the clinicians are getting paid, that's called neoliberal economics. That's not peer work. <laughs> that's like, that, that's the... <laughs> so... I think that it's in our best interest to be really clear about what what we what we mean when we say peer work, um, and and so you know over the last year, like me and a bunch of people um, have been laying down some structure for you know, um, and so for example, so here's an article that Pat Deegan wrote that's like I'm not I'm not going to bust it all out. But basically, we made this chart that was like, this is the this is the peer perspective, this is the clinical perspective, and this is the this is the space in between. Um, this is what this is what we have in common. And another thing that we did that I think, and here like another thing that we did that I think is really important is we created um, we created a I mean it's it's deceptively simple. We made a two-page checklist, 
that's like a supervisor's checklist for peer, for, for like to supervise peer specialists. Because what we realized was, or what I realized was looking around, was that people who were supervising peer specialists didn't actually know what the role was and did, therefore didn't were supervising peers in the same way you would supervise a clinician. Um, so, you know, we created a, we created a tool that, that, uh, that helps our, our teams a whole lot. And then I think the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is that um, this is a discussion that, that Nev and I have been having a bunch lately is, you know, um, we're really interested in, in how, I'm imagining this is a room of people who are, are familiar with the rap model. Head nods, I don't have to ask for head, you know. Um, so, so back in like 2005 when the Icarus Project was young and it was just like a bunch of us writing on, on the internet, on these discussion forums, we started, we, we got really excited about taking the idea of rap and expanding it um, and talking about social context, because the thing that was missing from rap was talking about, talking about oppression and talking about race and class and gender. Um, and, and like coming up with language where people could feel comfortable talking about it. And so, um, you know, so that's what we've been doing. And, and now, it, because I work for the Office of Mental Health, we can't call it T-Maps, which is what we call it outside. So it's called OnTrack Maps. Um, <laughs> but it's slick, right? It's like we just got, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's cool because we get to, we, we get to be inside the system. Um, Doing good, doing good work. So that's kind of the end of my spiel. Um, I, I feel like this idea of disruptive innovation is like a really, I find it really useful. It helps me on a daily basis when I go to work and I'm like thinking about like, oh my God, I work at the Psychiatric Institute. What, like, what am I doing? I know what I'm doing. I'm slowly changing the landscape and opening up space for other people. Um, so there you go. That's 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 what we got. And now it's never questions. Okay, well I okay. okay, sorry. I actually want to make a few more points about Sasha's awesome work that you didn't make. Um, just really quickly want to go back to because I think I've done a lot of um, consultation research, a lot of different kinds of work, both um, at the federal level with you know national technical assistance associated with the 10% set aside that funds a lot of these programs, um, and then with different states. And and one thing I want to say is like really just kind of lay out for you a little clear, a little more clearly some of the distinctions here. And so to go back to this side of Sasha's, right, multiple frameworks for thinking about psychosis. I've seen, you know, some degree of lip service in programs to this as kind of an ideal. Um, very rarely see that playing out in any kind of concrete, tangible way on the ground. So one piece of this in terms of how, you know, Sasha's doing this work at On Track is I think to really, I mean, a formalized training that is sort of part of the onboarding of staff that's part of their ongoing kind of continuing education and development is really about, you know, a, you know, efficient, but in, in another sense, really a deep dive into different frameworks that we can draw on, different practices internationally and nationally, including the Hearing Voices Movement, including the Icarus Project, spiritual emergence frameworks, and validating that um, up front in terms of what people are doing. Um, I want to say, too, that, you know, leadership have supported um, Sasha to do this, and this is something that we don't see in all in, in all programs. And so there's, there's sort of a synergistic set of things that have to go together in terms of the higher level support has to be there, and that's usually coming from people who do not themselves identify as having lived experience, and that sort of then capacitates, you know, this role coming in and really shifting the conversation in a more fundamental way and validating, um, validating that 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 kind of work. And then I think um, Sasha did not talk in you know in terrible detail about his supervision supervision checklist, but one thing I really want to emphasize there is that it sort of concretely, very concretely pushes back against the typical forms of co-optation that we see, um, and again, in a way that is supported by leadership. So it's not just kind of Sasha coming in in some tangential way. Leadership are saying, no, that really is what has to happen. And that means that the team leads, you know, um, really kind of have
have to start validating and, and, and including and integrating the peer role in a way that it is kind of coming in to the team and productively disrupting things, productively disrupting what would otherwise just be the status quo way of thinking about, talking about, and acting on um, psychosis. So, I mean, I hope in, in the remaining time, in terms of like where maybe where this conversation could go, is you know maybe discussing some of this, um, digging into it a little bit more. We all know that the rhetoric of so much of this exceeds the reality. This is one of the biggest problems. Every early intervention program in the country, actually almost every public mental health program, is now trauma informed, um, culturally competent, culturally sensitive. Um, you know, integrates peers, values use you know, um, youth voice, et cetera. So the problem is, is that we've, we've kind of reached a place where that is the ubiquitous rhetoric of all these programs. So then what does it mean to actually do transformative work within these spaces? Not to talk about it, not to claim that in some high, high level abstract way, but you know, the devil is in the details kind of stuff. So you know, any kind of, I, I think any kind of questions or dialogue that we can dive into about that would be awesome. Um, and it's it great to have so many people from the early intervention, you know, kind of world in this room. <laughs> Not over yet. <laughs> we want you to, we want you to talk. We have, we have a lot of time. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay, now we're really me? loud. Uh, sorry, way, way in the back of the room. Um, so I am the program director for the PrEP program in Massachusetts, one of the early intervention, um, early psychosis programs. And I'm wondering if we can have a bit of a dialogue about uh, third party reimbursement. Because I feel like, at the very beginning, you said, um, we know the mental health system is broken. And I actually sat down and wrote a note. And I'm like, how is it that everywhere I go, collectively, mental health professionals go, oh, yeah, we did. Like, everybody in the room nodded when you said that. We all know it's broken. And yet it's made up of us. And it's still broken. And so I've sort of been sitting and wrestling with that idea. And it feels like a lot of the drivers of that is the mental health insurance or, or health insurance in general and how we're beholden to that. I know it is true in my program and that we're lucky to be grant funded and that gives us the flexibility that we have to do the type of work we do. But I mean, they're very clear that that's not gonna last forever. Well, just one quick response to that. Um, Dave Shern and others at Nashbit, he was the lead author on this, and it just came out a couple of weeks ago, so wouldn't expect anybody to know about it yet. Um, looked at different creative strategies that states have used to finance early intervention, including specifically the peer support component, including specifically using peer support to go beyond, um, you know, kind of beyond the conventional kind of, you know, bottom line kind of billable hours. And I believe these, I know there's a lot of people here from Georgia. Um, I believe Georgia is one of the case studies in that document and specifically in terms of creative funding, you know, ways of tapping into different existing mechanisms but other states Oregon is featured in there you know so again there's no um, there's no one way I mean states are very different in terms of the ways they can tap into waivers they can tap into Medicaid state block grant money and combine that and be creative so I think there's some really good ideas in there so I don't think like that in and of itself is a reason to sort of give up and feel hopeless I mean I think there's, there's a lot of kind of creative potential um, even you know kind of given the funding structure that we have. And you know, maybe I'll you know, raise one of Sasha's, I think, really brilliant ideas here, which is to sort of better tap into existing like peer supports in the sense of like college students. Um, and maybe I'll let Sasha talk about that a little bit. But I think that there's, you know, the general idea being, is there more that we can do that isn't falling back on this system of clinical medical billing? Is there, yes, because there are all these systems that, you know, youth and young adults are naturally involved in and who their peers are that we're simply, you know, instead just, you know, again, drifting back to, well, clinical intervention instead of really building those, those bridges. But. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like we, uh, 
we have different strengths and different places where we, you know, where we work. I, as someone who I spent a bunch of time getting locked up against my will in psychiatric hospitals for years, on and off. And so for me, when I talk about the system being broken, yeah, for sure, there's some part of me that's like uh, I'm always going to feel like the system is kind of broken. I, 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 um, I think what Nev is referring to, as far as like the, you know. The, the strategy that I that I hold tight to, it's that really in the end I spend all this time developing these training modules, um, and I, it'll be great if they spread all over the country and all the peer specialists are using them. But I'm not banking on it. I mean, I'm I'll you know. And what I think about a lot more is what I do have faith in is that there are growing social movements outside of the mental health system, and I and I'm really interested in the intersection between um, those movements and the the mental health system. Because frankly, if these programs are working well, if like the on track programs are working well, the young people who are coming into them will not be staying in the mental health system, they'll be out of the mental health system and they'll be in the community. So that's, I don't know, that's what I think about. There. So first I want to say thank you. Um, my husband and I developed the West Virginia uh, specialized first episode psychosis program, Quiet Minds, based on the on track. We used your on track as our as our guide, so thank you for being our pioneer. Um, my question is, you were talking about um, training your peer support staff monthly, and I'm just wondering what kind of training you would provide. Yeah, all right, so yeah, it's, it's a lot less sexy than it sounds. It's like, I'm sitting at my desk at, at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, there's a computer in front of me, and uh, I'm talking on the phone to like all the peer specialists and they're looking at a PowerPoint, like the PowerPoint we're showing you today. And, I, and I've had to learn how to, um, after many years of facilitating rooms full of people where I can see people's eyes and gauge what's going on in the room, I've had to learn how to train people without seeing them. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm getting really good at it and hopefully I won't be doing it forever. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I work with the um, prep in San Francisco. And um, Sasha, you, you had, I think, a picture of dandelions up there and uh, the pioneers and mulberries or whatever. And I made the, the huckleberries. Um, I don't know blackberries. Blackberries. Here the, okay. The, the okay. Blackberries are like the Northwest uh, pioneer. Okay, I'm finished be. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it, it just brought to mind how, how we're, as a peer, how we're seen in the field now. And even with all the great work that's going on, PrEP sponsored uh, CBT P program or training for um, PrEP staff. But then it was determined that only clinicians could be in there. And, you know, okay, you know, I've been through it before, but I wanted to participate. So I said something, and they said, well, we're, we're developing training for peers. And so a couple months later, you know, the email came out, and there was a training. Um, and it was going to be for six hours rather than four days. So, and I'm leaving prep soon, so I feel liberated. I can say this. My response was, I demur. I choose not to participate in, in CBTP for dummies. Um, and, and the response, well, you can imagine. So I talked to some of the peers who went there, and the training was all about how peers can support clinicians in their treatment using CBTP. So, and so I'm, I'm, I guess what the point I'm trying to make is, going back to the weeds again, this is how we're still considered in, in the field in many, many places, even places that are presumed to be, you know, progressive thinking. So. Yeah, so thanks, Todd. And I mean, and, and just, to, just to take that even a little further, I mean, I think kind of what you're speaking to is that, you know, there's an underlying devaluation, not just of peer specialists in terms of like a lower paid 
less formally educated, maybe like role and kind of, you know, um, strata within the mental health system, um, but also that there's a deval there's a real devaluation of what that perspective actually is of, of multiple frameworks of exploration and engagement with experience outside of a, you know, purely biomedical frame or in the case of CBTP, a sort of a very distressed problem focused frame, maybe we could say. Um, and um, you know, I, and, and, and and so so all of that is is sort of devalued along with the role, and that's really really problematic. And so, you know, I think we want to kind of counterbalance um, these like great examples, like you know the work that Sasha is able to do it on track, and how leadership there is supporting that, and how it's becoming part of the culture. And at the same time, that there's many many places in which that's not true, um, in which there's a real need to sort of really kind of carefully critique what is happening and try to push that to change and that's not e that's really not easy um, so you know sort of I think you know a national dialogue about this would be the ideal uh, you know ideal ideal thing to really start discussing this um, in in this more like you know kind of gritty detailed way how can we change things how can we really change things and not just you know, kind of claim that these are gonna, programs that are gonna change young people's trajectories, but like, you know, really engage with these experiences in a fundamentally qualitatively different way. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I'm a nurse practitioner in, um, for two ESA programs uh, locally here and one county crisis team locally. So I have kind of a two-part question comment. Um, so, uh, in the crisis team that I work with, um, we see people short term, and there's been a big and there's a amazing group of peers who are part of the crisis team, and we've had a lot of um, patients slash clients slash participants who have come through the crisis team seeking help, who have worked with peers and are really interested in becoming peers, and it's brought up a lot. There's a big discussion on the crisis team happening now of how how. Is there a time when it's too soon for someone to apply for a job to work on the crisis team that they have just um, been, you know, in treatment or whatever word you want? They just went through it for help and now they want to be hired as a peer. And there's been a really, it's a really ongoing kind of rich discussion of, um, and there's a lot of kind of differing opinions on the crisis team uh, about that. And I think also that um, it brings up some questions a lot of questions in my mind, and I've spent so much time thinking, um, coming from the medical model, none of my training really um, prepared me to kind of navigate the ethics or boundaries about um, being on, uh, for example, with the crisis team, if they were to hire someone who I treated, how, and just looking for some theoretical structure um, to guide guide me in my work. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I can't, I can't find anything I, I, I'm sort of searching for that. That's my, sorry, I talked to, to go on. Yeah, I, that's a really, that's a really great question. Um, I am also somebody who has navigated those at times, you know, kind of very awkward reworking of relationships when you transfer from the clinical or patient role to a completely different kind of role. I don't know that there's any clear answer. I mean, in a way, it's so individual. How do you rework existing power dynamics? How do you, you know, make sure that there is not a kind of baggage from the past relationship that's going to render it extremely difficult to actually work? And it seems like that, that sort of thing, like, kind of has to be case by case because we're all such unique individuals. Mm -hmm. um, your other question, I mean, just one comment. This is not to sort of like, you know, downplay the importance of not putting people like peer specialists in a position in which, um, you know, they're set up to fail, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, I worry I just moved to Florida recently. I just got my driver's license. I just looked at what you need to do in the state of Florida to um, register as a psychologist. Um, in, in all those cases, you are asked detailed questions about your mental health history, any hospitalizations, um, diagnoses. And so there is something really problematic in a much like bigger picture kind of way culturally about singling out 
particular groups and saying, well, you now have this bar in terms of it, you have to have been stable or in recovery for X amount of time, whereas, like, you know, is anybody else, is any other kind of category of person ask those same questions or have these, if a rule is made, it's going to be in a way arbitrary because everybody's unique and individual. So, I, I mean, I would really kind of encourage staying away from some kind of algorithmic, it has to be X amount of time. There are states that do this, many of them around the peer specialist credential that have a set amount of time. You have to have been stable, unhospitalized, um, and or in recovery, however that's defined, before you can become a, a, or a credentialed peer specialist. So I think just really kind of thinking about that and then, okay, so if you're trying to avoid that, you know, how can there just be real conversations like you would maybe have with anyone around the assortment of challenges, competing caregiving, stressors, like everyone, you know, making it more about everyone rather than, rather than a group would. Could I, I give one really small example of just within my work uh, where I felt that just exemplifies this sort of um, uh, uh, unusual um, situation which I'm describing. So I was seeing a patient uh, or part participant through the crisis team who was really interested in peer support and they had a lot of questions for me about how long do you need to be sober in recovery or this or that. And so I went and got one of the peers and um, and had them join the, the visit which had been you know, the person was here for a medication visit or, you know, something something like that. So the peer joined, and so I was noticing how, um, I so I was, so I mean, I guess if it were not someone who was, so then it switched to a situation where this person is kind of curious about talking about a job with the peer person who I've just brought in, who happened to be the supervisor for the the peers on the crisis team. So then I was, it switched to thinking about how, um, how, how, how much detail can I provide about the questions with, that this person has just asked me because they were talking about sobriety and length of recovery or those type of things. Because now it's sort of like this is a potential job thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so I was just in, I was really in my head and not really sure how to, do you know what I'm saying? How that was is just one example of the two roles, kind of, of me being in a dual yeah. role, mm -hmm. and not sure how to go about it. But yeah. It's like you're practicing as a clinician, not as a peer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your whole it's that, your whole argument, it's part of your comment about mutual reciprocity versus the clinic role. It seems that's that's the way to define. If you either you're a peer, you're making this distinction about what a peer is in comparison to the clinical role. And I don't, it doesn't seem to me there's an issue about uh, disclosure, knowledge, presence, relationship in the peer role because you talk about it as a mutual. That is because it is that you're bringing it. So but it's so it's still. I mean, I, I think I think there is like there's a there's a good point. You know, I mean, there's a very important point here, right? Because there is still there are still power hierarchies even in a peer role because one person is being paid, and the other is not. Um, and one person has certain kinds of maybe both rights and obligations vis-a-vis -vis the other that are not truly mutual and, and reciprocal, right? So there is still a hierarchy there, and even there in, in research on peer specialists and what they find, you know, most problematic number of different studies from Canada and the U.S. have repeatedly found that actually, I mean, similar to what you're describing in terms of this is hard, I don't know how to do it. Things are crossing in ways I don't know how to navigate. Like, you know, peers are often reporting that depending on the exact way that the role is spelled out and I think hence some of the where we see sort of another set of tensions is between peer support happening completely outside the system peer support being compensated or not even if it's outside the system like does it sort of erode that if people are being paid if some people are paid and others are not so you have sort of a you know, paid person recipient even though it's completely outside of the system so I think I mean all of that is not so you know, clear, but th these are these are such great conversations to have. I mean, if we can really think deeply about exactly these issues and the subtle dynamics of power and how that plays out, I mean, to me, that's the answer, right, is having these conversations. So we have about 10 more minutes. We'll go here. Did you? Oh, yeah, I guess I was, I was just going to say that, you know, a part of the story I left out was that the the year before I worked at OnTrack, I worked as a, I, I went to social work school, and I was a, 
I was a, a clinical intern on a, at the parachute mobile treatment team in Manhattan, and so I worked on a team that was a mix of peer specialists and clinicians, and so I had a whole year of participating in and observing all kinds of interesting dynamics between uh, clinical staff and peer specialists and trying to make sense. And everyone had been trained in intentional peer support. Everyone had been trained in open dialogue. Um, and it, so it was like a, it was an intense laboratory of like really tricky power dynamics and uh, strong personalities. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, I, I feel like the answer to your question like, when it comes down to it, when I think about it, because I now do all these trainings for teams around how to hire peer specialists and where to, where to look for people, you know, where to look for peer specialists. And so much of it is, is uh, you know, it, it, it's like, it's less about, like, the intensity of your, your mental health history and more are you, like, good at connecting with people. That's your, you know, like, that's, like, some people are really good at connecting with people. Um, and when, if you, you're recently coming out of crisis, it can, you can be connecting with people and then have a hard time doing it. And how, how, like I know people who know how to navigate themselves. They go into crisis and then they come out of it really quick because they've been doing it for a long time. And that can actually be really helpful. That can be a useful thing for, for other people to see. And so those are my thoughts. Uh, could you give an example of constructive disruption, uh, something that maybe an intervention that either of you made where um, you really did reshape the direction that a uh, two medical clinical discussion was going. I'd like to be able to vividly see what that feels like when the peer role is working in a differentiated way. Okay, I hope this is helpful. This is the one that immediately comes to mind. So, um, because okay, so it's it's tricky, right? Because like I'm in a I'm I'm a trainer. I work on a training team with a bunch of other people. I'm also the only person on the training team who was locked up as an 18 year old and diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. And so and I come in with I come in talking the way I'm talking. You know, this is how I talk when at, at work. And <laughs> and um and so Pat. Pat likes to use the language of mi microaggressions to talk about how, like, how people can, without even realizing that they're doing it, end up um, basically dissing you. I mean, basically, like, you know, like, there's ways that without, you know, saying something to your face or calling you a name, put you down. Um, and so what's, I'm just going to give an example of, like, not from... I'm gonna give you an example from work, which is like part of my job is I do these, we call them care consultation calls where a number of different teams come on and it's, a, it's, a, it's like they describe, you know, they, they describe a case with, with a participant and then we all talk about it. And repeatedly, you know, and I'd be on the calls to give feedback and repeatedly I would give feedback and then the person who was writing down the feedback and like reporting at the end of the call would just leave my stuff out you know, just not included at all. And thankfully, I wish everyone had a Pat Deegan around to like, you know, like ha have their backs, you know, because I was furious. Um, but Pat, you know, was like, yeah, like you need to actually talk to that person and have a conversation with them. And I did, and now me and that person who's like the, you know, v very clinically focused, we have a very, um, there, because it was named, because it was like acknowledged, um, and there was enough, there was a space, there was a container to hold it, and it wasn't just like, oh, it's the crazy guy, it's the crazy peer guy talking. Um, things shifted. There's like a dynamic that shifted. So I think like you could use that example and then just scale out to just, if a team leader and a peer specialist build a relationship with each other where they trust each other, then when things happen on the team, there's space to call things out and talk about it. And I'll, you know, I'll add one, one, just one more example there. So I think there's situations in which 
leadership are supporting um, the folks trying to do this more sort of transformative peer work, and there are situations in which they're not supported at all, um, and in which, you know, I want to draw in, I know not everybody was in my presentation yesterday, but this sort of beautiful language of, you know, some people who are, who are speaking truth um, just, you know, just based on sort of the facticity of their being and persisting in exhausting oppressive spaces, but persisting there. Um, so one of my very dear friends um, who has also done incredible work um, in this early intervention space um, in a situation in which there was, you know, no support and yet by persisting, I mean, in spite of kind of, you know, just incredible, um, you know, forces kind of trying to stamp that out and constrain it, you have a person now ha who has broken through into a space, who is introducing things just by virtue of who they are and their own experience that is sort of disrupting the narrative that otherwise would just completely saturate that space. And so that's really important too. So even when there's no, there's nobody embracing that actively, there's nobody supporting that. You know, it's like it's creating cracks in that system. So I think that's another kind of form of, of, of creative disruption. And what does that do? It's starting to, it raises questions in people's minds. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're not there. They're not supported to go there. But now they have questions. And so I think that's really, really critical too. Um, obviously, it's a tragedy when that's not supported because of how incredibly hard it is on the, on the people who are holding that space, who are creating those cracks. I've been waiting for the past 10 minutes because I, I now have accumulated four questions. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I just want, want to comment on the issue of when is, it, when is it appropriate for an individual who is in a program to actually come back to the program and share a personal experience. Uh, uh, about three years ago, uh, we presented uh, in an I ISPS conference, and my co-presenter started as a client in the partial care program. She was my client in the partial care program, then became a peer counselor in the partial care program, and be became a presenter in the, in the ISPS conference. So in my opinion, there, is, there, there, is, there, is, there doesn't need to be any break in the time as long as you, are, you know the individual's strengths and you have systems in place to bring the individual on and just like you support every individual who is coming in, normal, abnormal, ill or not, to, uh, to help them succeed, if you have those systems in place, then you can succeed. Okay. So that, 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 that was one of my four. I, just, I don't want to hog the, <laughs> the, the microphone, so, but there, I have three, three other things. Uh, maybe very, very briefly in respect to, the, to this kind of a discrimination in terms of the training. Okay. Uh, we had training in the, in the ACT program about four years ago on cognitive behavioral interventions for individuals with serious mental illnesses. Everyone, including the two specialists, were part of the, part of the training, okay? Because we, we, we knew and believed in the special kind of uh, experience they bring to the table. And so to me, it is, it is so much to do with the culture of that particular place, okay, and the uh, culture of the organization. So my, when the organization uh, where I'm working said that, hey, we are supporting, uh, uh, say, a peer specialist here, I said, yes, to some extent, in the sense you have peer specialists in some programs <laughs> which are allowed by the state. Do you have peer specialists as part of your executive teams, do you have peer specialists as part of your board? Then you are completely supporting it. So that, it, it, tells, about, it tells about the culture, culture of the organization. Yeah, I, I mean, just on that on that note, all of this 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 research is not quite published yet. Um, we did a huge, huge survey of peer specialists around the country and looked at what was sort of the most important predictor of, um, you know, 
people basically kind of feeling the uh, recovery orientation of the organization, um, feeling supported as peer specialists, like all kinds of different, in a certain sense, outcomes or quasi outcomes. Biggest predictor of all of them was, so this is a novel kind of measure we created, which is the, the lived experience culture of the organization. And precisely, it's not just about are there peer specialists, it, it's are they integrated across the entire spectrum and hierarchy? Are there people in leadership roles? Are leadership, you know, kind of explicitly, concretely, um, you know, pushing for bringing in speakers, bringing in consultants, right? So cutting across levels, cutting across domains, research evaluation, program development, clinical work, um, and, and, and that's it. So I think that's a really, you know, really, really great point, and I think the challenge would be um, I'm sure there are programs in the room who like, sort of already get it, and so we're sort of speaking to the choir in that sense. How do we take the many, 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 many programs and agencies in this country that are not there and push for those changes? And how do we not sort of impose all of that burden on peer specialists, activists, advocates, who so often um, are, are just sort of crushed by the weight of you know, coming from, from the bottom up at the, at the you know, bottom end of this kind of hierarchy that's very <coughs> historically entrenched and trying to push for change. So can we get you know, champions for this kind of deeper change from, from, from other areas who are pushing, pushing for that as well? I'm sure you're one of them, but you know, kind of how, do we, how do we get more of this in, in, in the US and in certain spaces like early intervention? Mm -hmm. 